Hello and welcome everyone. It is the final meetup of the year for civil engineering. Uh, I'm excited to have Sean Holbert with me today and we will be talking about, or I should say, he will be talking about design subassemblies for road pro projects. So while we're giving everyone just a couple of minutes to get logged in and get their audio working, I would love for you to open up your questions panel and tell me where you are joining us from. And so um, just to give you a little about me, I'm Michelle Rasmussen, I'm in Utah, and uh, I'm the AEC content manager, which means I make sure I have the learning content you need to make your job easier. So I'm excited, uh, Christian is from the Netherlands, uh, he's with us today, and Lee from Toledo, Ohio, uh, Deidre from Missouri, Danny from Phoenix, Mark from Honolulu. Boy, Mark, I wanna come where you're at. Um, and Alex from Oregon, Ed from Washington, Ken from Ontario, Canada, Peter from the Netherlands, we've got a couple here, uh, Jenny from North Dakota. I spent some time in your neck of the woods, Jenny, about four years. Um, Thomas from Colorado, Michael from Halifax, Prague from uh, Toulouse, Janelle from Saskatchewan, Matthew from Indiana, Sagol from Tampa, Florida, Tanner from Ontario, Canada, uh, Kevin from Illinois, uh, Richard from Washington, Zeke from Virginia, uh, Jack from Missouri. It's so nice to have all of you here today. Um, I, I, sorry, I didn't get through all of the names. Uh, I, I do appreciate everyone joining. We know your time is valuable and we love to have you join us once a, a month for the, these meetups. So let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, let's get rid of some orders of business while we're letting everyone finish logging in. Um, Sean, if you go to the next tab and um, go ahead and introduce yourself, tell everyone a little bit about you. Okay, thank you, Michelle. So my name is Sean Holbert. I am a civil engineer here in the state of Oregon. I'm also a 30 year user of Autodesk products as of um, the year 2021. So um, just right around the corner, I'll have been a 30 year user of the products. I've been here at Autodesk for five years and I am a senior implementation consultant in our global consulting delivery group. I also wanted to give a shout out to the, um, there's, we've got a a user from Africa as well as a user from Israel, Michelle. Awesome. Yes, that's so great. I love seeing these global audiences. Let's go to the next slide um, and we'll just quickly let you know your lines are muted. That's simply to reduce the background noise because we are recording the session and a copy of the recording will be emailed to everyone who registered. So if you like what you see today, you wanna share it with your coworkers, friends, family, whoever, uh, you can always do that. Or you can go back and rewatch any piece of this uh, as you need to, to get, gather more information um, than what your brain could retain in, in this 60 minutes. Um, if you do have questions though, we do highly encourage questions. So please raise your hand in that participants panel or type your questions in that questions panel and we will come to a really good point in the presentation where we'll, we'll stop for questions and I'll either re repeat those questions for Sean from the question panel or I'll unmute your line if you've raised your hand to be able to ask that question live. And so with that, I'm gonna turn the, oh, I forgot we've got one more slide, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so those of you that joined us at Autodesk University, you may have learned a little bit more about our group network. Uh, the Autodesk group network is a global network of user groups, developer groups, and online groups. And you can join a group to connect with others. Uh, this will help you to learn, build relationships, share your knowledge. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can um, participate in those groups, and they're both physical and online virtual groups, just like these groups that we've been we've been running for the last year and a half. Um, but I'm really excited to announce that our monthly meetups that you've been coming to regularly are actually going to be transitioning over to the Autodesk Group Network platform. And so what we're going to do is after December, we're going to take a little bit of a break and reassess how we can make this more of a community meetup rather than just um, show up and spill a bunch of information and have you ask questions afterwards. So 
um, we definitely want to build more community with you and help you make those network connections so that you can gain the information faster uh, that, that helps you do your job better. So um, once we have an idea of exactly how we're gonna make that more community involved, we're going to be getting the details out to you uh, through the Community Dojo. And I'm going to post that link in the chat panel. And if you would like to watch any of the recordings of past meetups, you'll still have that opportunity through our Customer Success Learning Hub. And so I'll post that link as well. And so with that, I am going to turn the time over to Sean, who is going to talk to you a bit more about designing sub-assemblies for road projects. So Sean, the time is yours. Thank you very much, Michelle. And thank you again, everybody, for joining us this morning or afternoon or evening. Okay, so what we want to talk about today is some of the things that you'll need to understand if you want to use what we call subassembly composer, or you'll hear users refer to it as SAC or SAC. Um, what we will do is we'll talk about how you get started. And I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera here just to make my band with a whoop. I turned off the screen sharing and not the camera. There we go. That should be better. Um, now I can get my screen set up correctly. And so we'll talk about how we get started by getting the actual product installed because SubAssembly Composer is a separate product um, than, um, from Civil 3D, although it does ship with Civil 3D. We'll look at the overview of what the SubAssembly Composer interface looks like. And then we'll talk about the processes for developing a custom subassembly. And then we'll learn how to implement those or cut, we'll learn how to compose those subassemblies and then how to import those subassemblies into Civil 3D. And then we'll talk about some tips and tricks and some areas where you'll need to, uh, where you may run into some troubleshooting and um, just what workarounds that we'll introduce as well. Um, we do have the safe harbor statement, just in case I say anything about a future product development that may be coming down the pipes. We um, we wouldn't want you to make any purchasing decisions based on uh, future product improvements. I don't think I have anything in this particular presentation, but just in case I do, I love to have the statement up here. And if I do make a statement about a future development in a product, I'll go ahead and sh uh, we'll make sure to highlight that during the presentation. So why subassembly composer? Well, one of the things that you need to realize is that there's a number of stock subassemblies that are shipped with Civil 3D from everything that includes your generic links that give you a lot of flexibility inside your design all the way through very complex rail assemblies, subassemblies and assemblies that are included right out of the box. But while we do our best, we cannot cover all design situations. So what we need to do is give you the ability to modify the information that we've given you to improve your design scenario or improve the model that you're building. So we give you this interface that gives you a programming tool to add the intelligence that you're going to require to enhance the the, the model that you're building. And we can do everything from including custom disk ditch shapes and medians to noise barriers or um, you know, jersey barriers, concrete barriers, uh, guardrails, et cetera. And then we can share those with the rest of our team so they can be re-leveraged over and over. So before we get too far, oh, my, um, there we go. My other screen wasn't advancing with me, my apologies. You do have to install Civil 3D or um, Subassembly Composer as a separate subcomponent of Civil 3D. And if you've already installed Civil 3D, you can just go ahead and run through the setup file again, and it'll give you the opportunity to go ahead and add that back to your installation. Okay. So before we get too far down the list, let's talk about a few things that we assume we understand to begin with. So we know inside Civil 3D, when we're building a subassembly, we have a few components that are, are important for us to consider. There are points, our links, and our shapes, as well as our targets. And so what this gives us the ability to do is to extract information or to interact with those corridors that we're creating using these subassemblies, or excuse me, assemblies. And this gives us the ability to also extract that information for use with other products. And so a couple other things, like I said, you'll hear it referred to as SAC, is what I generally 
refer to it as or just subassembly composer. And then the PKT file is what we call the packet file. And that is actually where you're going to, is the file type that you're going to store your subassembly information inside. Some more terminology here about our input and output parameter types. So as we jump into subassembly composer, I'll show you where the, these particular elements are hidden or where they reside, they're not hidden at all. Um, but it's important for us to understand the basic variable types. So we have our integers, which are again, just, full, just our whole numbers, our double, which are just decimal precision numbers, string is a piece of text, our grade is our percent slope, our our percentage slope, our slope is the horizontal to vertical ratio difference. We also have our yes, no toggles for our Boolean values. And then again, we have our left and right or none for the sides of our road. And then there are some super elevation variables that you want to consider as well. If you're doing a more advanced subassembly that has to consider super elevation um, or super elevation axis of rotation, slope direction, or your actual pivot point. And so, so let's go ahead and let's look at the interface. But before we do that, let's talk about what's available out of the box for Civil 3D users. So currently what ships right now with Civil 3D, in addition to the sub-assemblies that you'll find, are the sub-assemblies that you can now see on the screen. And I will bring up the link where you can find those here. My apologies, I should have had it on the screen for us, but I will post it in the chat. These are located on your C drive under your program data, Autodesk, Civil 3D, the language that you're working in. And then you'll see right here, we have our sub assemblies. And so these are a number of ones that do not install out of the box inside your Civil 3D user interface, but they are available for you to work with inside Civil 3D. And I always say that it's much easier to critique or to modify something than it is to create it from scratch. So if you're looking for any additional subassemblies that you either want to start using the subassembly composer to work with, or you want to you know, give these a try instead of customizing your own, definitely take a peek in that directory. And let me do as I promised here a second ago. And I will post where you can find that over here in the chat. And again, that should install with every user. The ENU obviously is the, the language. So if you're using a different language, then you'll want to make sure to correct that in your link. Also available online, and I do have the link here on the screen for us. So I was thinking a little bit ahead. And um, these are the additional packet files that are also available to Civil 3D users. And all you have to do is go here to the autodesk.com Civil 3D subassemble PKT files for the version that you're using. And if I'm not mistaken, the PKT files are not version dependent. I could be mistaken. And I'll have to do some research on us on that topic and follow back up with you for that. But um, these are additional subassemblies that are available. And let's take a quick peek at what those look like. Now, these are some sample data that will definitely give you the ability to get started doing your customization if you find that that is necessary. So we'll come over here to Oops. Too many folders open, my apologies. And you'll see in these packet files, again, we have a number of um, samples that you can pull from or ones that you can actually just use in your design right out of the box, so to speak. Again, these are the ones you actually have to download from the subassembly or from the learn site um, on the Autodesk AKN or the Autodesk Knowledge Network. The ones that we were showing right here, these are the ones that install natively with Civil 3D. They, are ju they just need to be imported into your Civil 3D environment, which we will show you how to do here shortly. So let's, oh, see, I have my slides out of, um, out of order there. My apologies. So we're going to talk about the user interface here as we jump over into SubAssembly Composer. And so what you'll see here is we have a number of different areas that we want to 
um, talk about, and we have the ability to move these around to our different screens. So if we're fortunate enough to have multiple screens to work with, we can move these different components or these different windows to the different screens that we're working with to give ourselves a little more workspace. And as you get into more complex subassemblies, and we'll show you that here in just a second, you'll see why it would be important to start rearranging your panels. And then you can also choose which panels are being displayed. And we'll show you this actually live. So the first thing to talk about is our toolbox. The toolbox contains all of the different elements that we're going to use to construct our subassembly. And as you can see here, we have our geometry elements, our bit most basic elements. We get into some more advanced geometry. Then we start talking about auxiliary points who will help us define conditions inside our assemblies, pardon me. Then we can also add workflows, which will include uh, flow charts or subflow charts, sequences, decisions, and then switches. And this gives us the ability to add additional information to our subassemblies. And you'll see one of the most basic decisions that we, we will ask in the early parts of our subassemblies is whether or not we're working in imperial or metric units. And then we have the miscellaneous information that is available down below. Oops, I got ahead of myself there. Just get caught up. Give everybody a second to read what's on the screen here. Now let's talk about our flow chart. So as you can see here, a flow chart, is, this is actually exactly what it sounds like. This is where we're starting to build our subassembly. And so this is where we'll start adding those geometric elements that are from our toolbox into the workspace. Now we'll, you'll see that we'll start out with even sub flow charts underneath our menus to keep like elements or like parts of our subassembly together. And you'll see that actually here in just a second. And then we have the preview. Now this is actually what our design is going to look like as we're going through our processes. So this will help us understand what it's going, what our model is going to look like Yeah, let me take a quick pause here. Um, Kiran gave us a, a interesting point that the images for the subassemblies that are shipped with Civil 3D actually don't include are not included on the metric side. Now you will they will pull from that location. They're just not in underneath the metric directory. Thank you for pointing that out. That's um, definitely helpful and I'm I should have pointed that out myself. So the roadway is going to show us the subassembly as it's being built and using any of the targets that we've assigned. And then we can also go into the layout mode, which shows the subassembly being used with the input parameters only. Now let's talk about the different properties of our sub subassemblies. So this will cover all the properties of the individual elements that we're adding to our subassembly. So once we start adding the individual geometry elements, this will give us the ability to put the intelligence to those elements or actually, um, I guess for lack of a better term, to assign the code to these particular subassembly elements. And then our settings and parameters. And this is actually where we put all of the brains or all of the intelligence into our subassemblies. This is where we put in our input and output parameters, as well as our packet settings, and then our target parameters. And then we can go into the subassembly or the super elevation and can't if needed in a more advanced temp in a more advanced subassembly. And then we get the opportunity to look at our event or event viewer to tell us what's going on. So if we run into a scenario where we can act cannot actually solve our subassembly, we'll have the ability to see these elements as a warning inside our event viewer. So now the settings and parameters in our packets. This is where the we're going to pull the information inside Civil 3D to tell us all about the subassemblies that we're leveraging. And then again, our parameters. Now, one thing that's important to understand about our settings and parameters, or excuse me, our input output parameters, are that they can pull information only from elements that are higher above them in the sequence, and you cannot change the sequence. So what we're gonna talk about here in a few minutes is sketching out our workflow, 
workflow or putting our model to get you know putting our model together on paper literally before we put it into code that way when we actually are building our elements we can have our parameters for input and output assigned ahead of time in the correct order and then our targeting parameters this is where we're going to you know put the basic elements back into our model where where are we going to have this subassembly interact with other elements inside civil 3d and then here's a little bit about our super elevation and then our cant which is super elevation for rail i, I think basically <laughs> and then our event viewer so let's talk about the process of putting together a subassembly now again the first thing that you're going to ask is do we actually need to customize this subassembly with all of the out of the box ones that we just shared as well as the ones that are shipped as well as the one the the samples that you can pull from you know it might become more and more rare that we need to leverage this tool but we definitely need to know it's here because we can take those samples that we have and make small modifications and solve our problems so again let's identify the need for the custom subassembly and then we do we i i basically recommend that you go through the process of getting you know putting a rough sketch together what are you trying to solve with this particular subassembly are we trying to use this a as maybe a complex sidewalk scenario to substitute driveways in where we have landscape strip typically or verge typically i believe it's called overseas um and then we want to go ahead and sketch this out you know in real life in cat and that way we have some understanding of some you know have we sketched something on paper that cannot really be reproduced in a cad environment and then we'll walk through the process of de developing the flow chart for that sub assembly what are our input and output variables what are the parameters that we're seeking what are the solutions that we're seeking to solve for and then we actually jump in and start building the sub assembly so we have all our backup material we have all the supporting data and we build our sub assembly now the next step is going to be that iterative process where we go over to Civil 3D and we import the subassembly and then we test it. And when we test that subassembly, we try to break it. You know, try to put the all of the parameters that you think any of your users may you put inside your subassembly and see if you can actually make this solve for any of the scenarios that you can come up with. And I can guarantee that you're not going to come up with all, and somebody's going to find a, a loophole or a, a, an area in the subassembly that um, they're asking the question that cannot be answered. And the way that we fix that is we can either go in and try to refine our subassembly, but most important, we want to document those findings. If we've developed a subassembly that's a curb and it's supposed to shrink down in a different region to, to go to no exposure or to a lip exposure for a driveway, and we find out if we put in a negative value, it breaks. Is that something that we really need to spend hours on fixing? Or do we just document in the process that don't put in negative values, it'll break the subassembly? So you evaluate whether or not a, a, refine, a, a revision needs to be made or if it's just pure documentation that'll help solve the problem. So now we're evaluating the steps of putting that subassembly together. First, we want to define our packet settings. Again, that's where we're going to send that information over to Civil 3D to tell our users about what this subassembly is going to do for us. And then we want to define the input and output parameters for that subassembly because we're going to need to pull those input and output parameters into our subcharts or subflow charts and add those parameters to our geometry. Now, we can always go back and create more parameters if we've discovered that we needed a few more. And I would even recommend if you discover parts in your process that you, um, you need to be supplemented, document that during your discovery session or during your workflow session. And then we go in and we start adding our geometry. We start adding any of the conditions that we want to solve for as far as um, the, the question statements. Are we, you know, our very first statement decision is, is this a metric or is this an imperial unit um, subassembly? And then we go into the process of assigning the codes that will be extracted inside Civil 3D that will help complete our corridor or help build our code sets inside Civil 3D. And then again, we're going to import and test, we're going to refine, and we're going to document our findings. So before I jump over and just show you kind of the simple process that we're going to go through, do we have any questions, Michelle? None so far. 
Okay. Actually, I do have one person. Clive has his hand raised. Um, so, Clive, I'm going to unmute your line really quick. Uh, do you have a question for Sean? Clive Sayers? Oh. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> Go ahead, Sean. All good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So let's talk about how to compose a very simple subassembly. Now, the one that I'm going to show you is um, obviously available in the list that I've just shown you is available for download. So it's going to be fairly basic, but it's going to, pardon me. <laughs> the weather in Oregon can't decide if it's going to be sunny or raining, and that gets my throat tickling. So we're gonna go through this basic process of creating a very simple box culvert. And I've put the link down here at the bottom. This is one of my colleagues put together this class. And the interesting part about this particular class is this is one of the most basic elements I think you could put together inside a in sub subassembly composer. And then she goes into one of the most complex um, subassemblies I've ever seen created by anyone inside subassembly composer. She actually creates a bell-shaped tunnel in this class um, as the final presentation for this particular Autodesk University lab. And that information is still available and you can see the link here at the bottom if anybody wanted to capture that. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna jump over inside. I'm gonna minimize this here real quick, take a break from PowerPoint. And let's, oops. Let's go ahead and get back into Civil 3 or inside Subassembly Composer and take a look around and get familiar with the different components that we just talked about. So what I've got opened up here just for um, illustrative purposes is one of those sample files that are available to you. Now, again, this is from the samples that need to be downloaded, but what this is giving you the illustration on how to do is to create simple curves inside your subassembly composer. And so again, here's our toolbox. Um, as we move things around, you can see that we have our ability to dock our elements in different locations on our screen. And then most important, we can restore the default layout. So as you'll see, if I'm trying to build a fairly complex, and let's look at a very complex subassembly here. If I'm trying to build a fairly complex subassembly, as I'm zooming in and then shrinking down my flow chart so I can see my dam here, and then I come back over to my flow chart, I'm gonna find myself doing this quite often. Use my control to zoom in. And then you'll see that these are individual elements inside our, or individual um, groupings inside the flow chart. So as we start to open these up, you can see that these strings can get quite complex and quite long. And then as we get down in here into defining the shapes, you can see that things are even, whoop, that was actually the individual shapes, but you could see that the sequences and the process of putting these individual parts together can be quite involved. So you'll definitely wanna move these tools around and put them on your other screens if available. Make them full size if you'd like. And then again, you know, sooner or later, you're gonna to have to go back to default because we're gonna be sharing this with somebody and we're gonna be using a laptop so we can go restore those defaults or we're trying to do a presentation. So let's go ahead and just start up here with a new subassembly and get the basic process started. And I'm gonna open up my cheat sheet because I don't have this memorized. And again, the very first thing, oop, do we have a question, Michelle? Nope. Okay, I thought I heard something there. Um, okay, so what we'll do here is we're gonna start out by just assigning our basic um, packet parameters here. So we're just gonna call this our box culvert. And we're just gonna call, you know, call it what it is. And if we, once we get our image file created, cause we've drawn this out in CAD and then we've created the image that we'll need, we can go ahead and attach that here and any help documentation as well. Then we can also come back and add those elements later. And maybe I should learn how to spell culvert. And so then the very next step that we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna jump right over and start talking about defining our input and output parameters. 
Now the sample that we have here, um, I believe the presentation that is um, um, that's online that I'm pulling from is actually intended to be used in metric units, but we'll go ahead and just proceed as is with the um, the values provided. And pardon me if my keyboard typing is loud. And you'll see here that we cannot add spaces to the element or to the um, input output parameter names. And then we'll want to make sure that we're using a double unit for this because we want to be able to add decimal units. And we'll just go ahead and start out with a parameter of 12 and we'll call this box culvert width. Now, one of the most important things that I'm going to say, and this is regardless of if you're creating a subassembly and subassembly composer or if you're creating an assembly inside Civil 3D with the out of the box subassemblies that are shipped. It is very important that you come up with an object naming convention. Object naming conventions these days, especially in the cloud environment, are becoming as important as a good drawing or a good layer naming convention. And what I mean is that the individual subcomponents of your assembly can get quite complex. And if you've not done a good job about naming where these elements live or what these elements purposes are, you can find yourself bouncing back and forth between dialog boxes just to try to figure out you know, what somebody's design intent was, especially if you're picking up somebody else's design. So again, the object naming convention is very critical, I feel, in your BIM execution plan. And why I'm doing this, I'll just go ahead and open that up again for any questions. And I'll try not to type and talk at the same time. Sorry about that, everyone. And we'll go ahead and set that at 10. And if I was smart, I'd go like this. And then we need a wall thickness for our culvert as well, because that's another parameter. So what we'll, what I probably should have done here is actually um, taken a picture of the sketch that we used for this particular workflow to show you what my thought process was to come up with these individual parameters. But if you look back on the PowerPoint, let me go back there for just two seconds here. You'll see that we have, you know, we don't want to overthink our process here. Do we need to assign a thickness? Well, definitely in a box clover, you, it's something that you would generally assume as a parameter. So think about what your user is expecting to put in. So your parameters that you're creating here inside your subassembly will be, you know, you clearly set those expectations with the users as you're developing both your, your help documentation and any of the links that you're including. Let me go ahead and minimize that again real quick. And we'll set that as a minimum of one and we'll just go wall thickness. Okay, so now what we've done here is we've set up the individual parameters that we're going to use inside our subassembly. Now you'll see that all we've got here this time is a is our um, double in our side parameters. And the side is always required and you can always set it to none, but you can't get rid of it. Okay, so let's jump over here into our flow chart and let's just start creating the different parts. So I'm gonna go ahead and make this a little bigger. And as you can see, it is it would become handy to start separating this. Let's just repeat myself. Can we see? Oh, perfect. Um, thank you, Michelle. So we did have a quick question about seeing the sketch of the box culvert again. And I, I think that was answered by me bouncing back over there. But um, if not, let us know, Jen. Jenny, sorry. Let's go ahead and pull down our point here and let's start talking about the individual elements. Now, the it's important to start understanding our prefixes. We have a few prefixes that we want to understand. We have points, links, and shapes, P, S, and L, as well as auxiliary points and auxiliary links. And so these are important things that we need to take into consideration while we're doing our process here and they're things that we cannot change. So we, you know, these are definitely want to know what we're looking at just by evaluating it on screen and not having to actually select those individual elements. And for illustration, because I like to do that, 
if you were over here and you're, well, this was not as great, but um, you want to make sure that you're figuring out what these individual components are based on your on-screen knowledge of what's being displayed instead of having to search and um, select each and every one. Made that a lot more difficult than it really needed to be. So what you're going to see right now is that we're going to start building this particular subassembly for the um, for the box culvert. So we start out with the number the point number one, and you can see that's the connection point over here in our preview. Again, we have our layout mode and we have our roadway mode. And if we had a surface that we're targeting, that's where we'd start to worry about the the different modes, but um, not for this example. And now we want to come over and we want to add a second point. So as we add a second point, what you're going to see is it's going to add a point and a link. Now let's tell it where point two is. Now, if we go back to our subassembly again, and let me zoom in on this real quick, you can see that we're going to build it counterclockwise and we're going to build the inside the same way. So as we come back over here, our po our port our excuse me our point two is a delta x and a delta y from point one. And what is that variable? Well, it is the width or the outside width of the box culvert. So we can come over here. Whoops. and add that for our X variable. Now, as I zoom in here, because I was a little bit large, you can see that it added link number one and then point number two. Now back in here, we do have the ability to turn off that link if we so, cho so choose, and you can see that it automatically starts adding that link information for us. So now we'll just go around the horn here and create the rest of these points. So point number three is what? It is a delta X and Y from point number two. And what is it? It's the outside height. But it's the negative outside height because we're building this element from the top of the box culvert and then going clockwise. And that's um, actually, let's go and put that under the Y element again, and we'll leave X as Z. And so now you can see us going around the box here. And continuing that process, we'll go ahead and add now. One of the things I failed to do here, and I should have done at the beginning, is actually come over and created that subflow chart that we were talking about. And that gives me the ability, again, to kind of keep things grouped together. But because we're using a pretty simple or exa example here, um, we didn't go ahead and complete that process. So my apologies. Now we're going to go negative x box culvert outside width so again just as an example you can type or you can um now we've got an error so what's going on here so point four is a delta x and y from point three should be i spelled something wrong so let's do the copy and paste yep i spelled culvert wrong there we go so unintentional, but we did get the error warning here to let us know that the parameter that we're assigning for the X value is not a parameter that we had previously created in our input output parameters. And so now all we need to do is we want to add that last link, link number four, to close our box. And link number four should go from point number four to point number one. And voila, we've closed our box all the way around. Now, the next step that we want to do here is add our point number five for the thickness. And this is where we're going to add that variable. So again, we should have created these in um, groups together, but we did not. So let's go ahead and say point number five is a delta X and Y of box culvert thickness and negative y box culvert thickness. So let's zoom in here real quick and you'll see that that created point number five for us. Now again, we just go right back around the horn to create those inside elements. And you can even cheat um, 
and just use the copy and paste over and over and over because that's what you're actually changing. You don't want to actually put a width inside here because you haven't defined that parameter. So you're going to base everything off of point number two over and in, point number three up and in. So this is from point number two. It's going to be the negative X and the negative Y. And that's where I was trying to cheat. Oop, and we don't want that link. We want the line to go. We want the line to go from 0.5 to 0.6. And so different process to cre create same parts of the subassembly. So again, um, we could actually, actually I'm gonna get rid of this line for just a second. I wanna create the rest of my points. Turn off that line. We wanna come up from point three. It'll be the negative X and the positive Y. And then our last point here, from point number four, positive X, positive Y. Okay, now we can come back in. Oop, did not want to add that point or that link. Now we come back in and add those individual links. And because of this process, as you can see, we would have wanted to go through there and actually, um, again, keep these things separated. And we're going to go from five to six. Six to seven. Uh-oh. Something bro broken in here. Um, there we go. Okay. Got to get those broken elements fixed before anything shows up. So that's another um, unintended example here, but um, that's why things weren't showing up here is that we were missing the, we had a, um, a warning as part of our problem, as part of our on-screen education, so to speak. So now the last thing we want to do here is we want to actually drag the shape in to define this box. It's, oops, that's not where we want to do it. We want to drag our shape in here. And what that's going to give us the ability to do is pick those elements on screen. So here's this particular shape. And if we select it, we can see that that's the material that we're using. Now, we can add another shape as well. In this particular shape, we would again add our links, shows you the entire box. So that would be material to be removed. And maybe that's an element that we would call out here. And that's going to be an element that we actually have to add to our model. So we're not going to do that in this example because we do want to import this into Civil 3D and show you that process. So let's go ahead and save this guy. And let's, um, again, there I go, breaking my own rules. Give it a relevant name. And then let's jump over into Civil 3D. Um, and I should have had a drawing open that had a alignment in it because it's not going to do much good to show a corridor without an alignment. Or it's not going to be possible to show a corridor without an alignment. I have my, there's my tutorials. And we better check and make sure that we've got the right type opening. Okay, so we're going to have a, we've got a corridor here in this drawing. We've got a surface, we've got a profile. 
And what we're going to do is we're just going to swap this corridor out for the cord or the subassembly that we just created. So let's go ahead to our tool palettes. Now again, um, you could create a new tool palette, and I do recommend you create a new tool palette if you want to import your samples. And it's easy as right-clicking here, say import subassemblies, go to our source files or where your PKT files are located. Let's go down here. And it would be in uh, um, reference material, civil 3D, subassemblies. And we'll bring the Imperial ones in. You'll see that I can select them all. And voila, they're going to go ahead and import everything into my samples. And that was probably not the best decision to go ahead and import them all live. Oh, no, okay, it didn't take near as long as I thought. <laughs> but as you can see here, here's quite an enhanced list. Um, another thing I wanted to point out to you before we jump into bringing the one that we just built in is your rail assemblies. So you have to click the sub assemblies over here to get the rail to activate. Um, I, that might have gone away in 2021. I'll have to check that for us as well. But that also gives you the more ad advanced rail sub assemblies that are available for you to leverage. So let's go back up here to our samples and let's just go ahead and create a new tool palette. And let's see if we can import the one that we just created. That would be if I can remember where I put it. Okay. And so one of the things I'll let you know is number one, I didn't create the image as you as you saw. Um, the other thing I'll let you know is that if you need to remove this from Civil 3D, what you need to do is remove it from your tool palette, close Civil 3D, reopen Civil 3D, and then re-import your revised version. So let's see if we can just go here and we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cheat. Put our box culvert in. There it is. Check out our parameters. Here's the parameters that we created, the ones that we added. Now, let's go ahead and rebuild our corridor. Now, obviously, this is a very simple and quick example of what we're um, creating here. And in the time that we had allotted, and you know, it's about all we really could get done. But as you can see here, we have that box culvert modeled for us as a corridor. Now, I definitely recommend you uh, go out and check out Wendy's presentation. Um, it's composed like Beethoven. It is a wonderful. Um, that's a, another great question there on the um, from Kiran. One second, let me double check that. Um, it's a it's a really great presentation that she put on um, the the bell shaped um, excuse me the bell shaped tunnel that she created is is got some of the most complex math that you'll see um, in a while I'm pretty sure and yes I do think you're right Karan there are no spaces allowed inside your PKT files as well as in your parameters as you're defining them. So we got about 10 minutes left here. I'm going to jump back over into the presentation and I just want to show you a couple more um, tips and tricks and things like that. <coughs> hey, Sean, before oh, yeah. you jump into that, do you mind yep. if we address Michael's question? Um, Michael says, can you share how to generate a tool palette for custom sub-assemblies to be shared to all users across the network environment? Do we have time for that? I, I don't think we do. Um, it We've definitely got that documented. Let me see what I can find for you here. Um, what I always fear is when I go into one of these, pro when I go into something that I haven't practiced, I may do something um, extraordinarily bad. Um, yeah, what we'll have to do, um, I, I haven't done it in such a long time. I will we'll follow back up with you on that one and we'll get you that information over. But it's definitely a great question and definitely something that comes up quite a bit. So if you'll remind me, Michelle, I know that we've got actually a um, civil 3D presentation, or excuse me, an AU presentation on that process. Okay, and, and we can find it later and send it with the email afterwards as well. Perfect. Sorry about that, Michael, and thank you. 
So here are just a couple of the things that you want to check before you're importing your subassembly. You want to make sure that your flow chart and your parameters are all assigned properly. As you can see that this is getting into a little bit more detail or a little bit more complex subassembly than what we worked with. And so you'll start to realize that it's important to start bundling your activities. And you'll also see up here in some of our parameters that we're creating or some of the objects that we're creating, we're defining our um, variables inside our subassembly. So again, to import it, we come over to import subassemblies, or as you saw me do, you right click, tell you where you want to put them. I always recommend you create new um, tool palettes for the subassemblies that you're importing. Browse to the PKT, choose where you're putting it, and say okay. And again, you can select multiple ones. And again, I highly recommend you play with these before you start to create your own. Now, the other process that we didn't talk about was adding those code sets. You can inherit the individual code sets from the materials that you've assigned in your subassembly. You'll need to do that. And again, if you needed to update your subassembly, here's that process documented for you. You'll exit, you'll go ahead and remove that subassembly from your tool palette, exit Civil 3D, update your civil, your um subassembly and subassembly composer, and then re-import that subassembly into Civil 3D. So it's a bit of, it won't live update from a PKT file, I guess is what I'm trying to tell you. So um, I got that out of order too. I don't know how I got my slides out of order today, my apologies. But again, the first thing you wanna ask before you go down this um, rabbit hole, so to speak, um, it's a great tool, don't get me wrong, I love it. But you know, just because you can customize something doesn't mean you should. And I'll give you a great example. Um, with a customer, we were looking at trying to build a lined channel. And as I started looking around and starting scratching my head, I realized in these sample files, we have lined channels. Now it was a good process to go through. It was a great learning experience to show them how to build it. But we wanna make sure that we check all the available resources before we go and customize something. And then again, it's easier to critique something or modify it for your own use than it is to start from scratch. So there's probably something here that you can start with. And then again, like, you know, why are we talking about this today? Because there may be a need for you to customize these elements, even though we've done, you know, the best we can at Autodesk to get all that information available to you. Can't cover everything. Um, I said it once, you'll hear me say it again here, know your prefixes, know what an auxiliary point will do for you, what your points will do for you, or what your points are doing for you, and then be able to recognize and recognize them on screen really makes your process easier. And again, as you're doing your workflow, you might want to go back in and update your documentation to include where those points are at. And then, you know, save any help information that you can for your end users, anything that you can tell them about that particular tool, include that in your documentation. It'll make their life easier when they're leveraging it. Just a couple more tips and tricks here. You know, again, make sure you sketch things out. Again, you cannot use those spaces and parameters. You need to save the PKTs before you delete some parameters. The parameters go in in a hierarchy from top to bottom. You cannot reorganize them. Um, and then you want to keep track of all your elements. Again, go back and update your sketches to include all that information. If somebody opens a sub a corridor that you have created with a custom subassembly, they're going to get an error dialog box that just indicates that they need to import that PKT file for their use. And so we talked today about you know getting started. You know what is subassembly composer? We went down a little bit of a slight tangent and we talked about, well, um, okay, but there's a number of PKT files that are delivered with Civil 3D that aren't even inside the product natively. So do we need to you know, know more about SubAssembly Composer? And you know, in our decision table, we answered the question, yes. So we talked about what the interface looks like. And then we talked about the process for going through the um, developing the subassemblies. And then we actually created that quick subassembly, um, you know, not very complex. And again, it's one that's available to you, but it is something that was, you know, just to get us through that learning process. And then we dumped that subassembly into our corridor model and updated our corridor. So with all of that, I will go back to my question and answer slide and ask if there's any, um, any questions.
All right. So um, Kira uh, points out when importing the PKT file, you must always import into a new palette, or must you always import into a new palette? If so, can you move the PKT file to an existing palette once imported? Great question. And um, the answer is no. I can come over here to my tool palettes in Civil, and I could import the one that I just created into this tool palette. And so it gives you the opportunity of where you want to import it. So I want to import this sample into that tool palette. Oh, yeah, because it's actually being in use inside here. Let's just go ahead and import the the sample one twice. Let's test. So it's in sample, or it should be. Subassembly two, that would be the test one. Oh, and there's box culvert too. It did come in. Why didn't it say sample box culvert? Because I have my parameters set wrong. <laughs> okay, so if you have additional questions, go ahead and type them into the Q&A panel, or you can raise your hand in the attendee panel and uh, I can unmute your line. So it looks like Sarah, uh, Karen says, is there a way to generate missing PNG files, such as for the metric folder? Um, let's go ahead and look at that. You know, that's a great question. I, I'll definitely take that one live. I am assuming, and we all know what happens when we do that, but I'm assuming that what you want to do is just come over and repath them. So if we jump over into my reference material here, subassembly, open my subassemblies up. So if I open up my metric ones, they are pathed here to the image file. So I could actually just repath these to the actual, you know, I can actually relocate these images underneath metric and then repath these and resave them and that would update them. Okay, great. And Another Dave asks, question. oops, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, no, that's okay. So Dave asks, how do you connect points along the corridor? Um, that was a setting that would have been taken care of inside my corridor when I was inside Civil 3D. So that was just me getting a little click happy and not actually um, updating my corridor correctly. But it, it will provide those links. Um, the other question that I wanted to make sure to um, address there, Michelle, was the, can you customize the out-of-the-box Civil 3D subassemblies? The only ones that we have access to custom and out-of-the-box are the ones that we were just looking at that are in the PKT format. The ones that you're going to find over here were written with different codes, so we do not have access to the PKTs. However, a number of these, um, for example, if you come down here and look at curbs, you know, a number of these are more or less reproduced inside these samples. So you can see that there's quite a few curb examples. Um, oh, here they are up top here as well. I think. Huh. I thought we could sort it. I guess I can't. But here's a, a couple other curbs with pipes embedded and then just a curb with a curb ramp. So this actually you can control the curb height. Okay, great. And we are about out of time. Um, we have one minute left. Do you have time to talk a little bit about um, Actually, did you? We already talked about this, didn't we? Uh, how to connect a point along the corridor. Yep, yep. Uh, that was the yep, setting. Okay, sorry. Just failed to turn on. <laughs> Not sorry. Okay, so that brings us to time. So thank you very much, Sean, for your preparation in this and and the great presentation. Um, I want to especially thank everyone who joined us today. We know your time is valuable, and we're very honored that you shared your time with us for the last hour. So thank you, everyone. We will see you after the holiday break and uh, possibly be getting all that information out to you to be starting these back up in February. Thanks for attending everyone and thank you for doing this, Michelle. You bet, take care.